back in. Slow service. That means they're making sure everything is perfect. That's my Marie. Always finding that silver lining. My sincere oh. apologies. For both startling you and for making you wait. My attention was needed elsewhere. I promise from here on out, it will be nothing but silver linings. Welcome to the World's Fair Hotel. Please, sign in here. First time in Chicago, I'm going to hazard a guess and assume you're here to take in the exposition. The fair, yes, but that's not all. Today is a very special day for us. Oh, a honeymoon. How very, very lovely. <clears throat> Perhaps my wife, Mrs. Whitman, would like to sign. <sighs> in that case, an upgrade is in order. A honeymoon suite it is. Oh, well, uh... Are the rates that much higher? <laughs> I think nothing of it. The same rates as your regular room. The upgrade is on us. You're our first honeymooners. How kind. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Henry Howard Holmes. In 1895, Chicago police uncovered evidence of torture and multiple murders at the castle of H. H. Holmes. H. H. Holmes designed his building solely for the disposal of human bodies and was known as America's first serial killer. Although, I'm not so sure that's true. H. H. Holmes, born May 16, 1861, and raised in Gilmanton, New Hampshire as Herman Webster Mudgett, was raised under strict religious studies by his mother and a heavy hand by his father. Herman excelled in his school studies. However, he was bullied by his schoolmates. According to Herman, he was dragged into the office of a town doctor by a couple of schoolmate bullies and forced to face a skeleton of which Herman was frightened. Due to the incident, and although he was scared, this was a stepping stone to Herman having a strong curiosity of the human body and eventually going to school for medicine. After spending one year at the College of Vermont, Herman Mudgett enrolled in the University of Michigan Medical School on September 21st, 1882. Herman Mudgett excelled in chemistry and human anatomy. Unlike most serial killers, Mudgett finished his schooling, graduating in 1884. It is said Mudgett became immune to death and dismemberment from operating on human cadavers. During his time at the University of Michigan, Mudgett also dabbled in scamming by insuring people and substituting cadavers that were unidentifiable in place of their corpse. That's some serious creepiness but I guess you gotta do what you gotta do to get through school, even in those days. All kidding aside, Mudgett was on his way to becoming a true crime sensation. After his graduation, Mudgett went on a statewide spree of cons and swindles. He also served as a drugstore clerk, asylum attendant, a teacher, and a doctor. Why so many professions? Who knows? 
but it may have made it easier for him to move around and obtain jobs wherever he went. To avoid his acquaintances from coming forward with accusations of fraud, scamming, conning, or even the worst, murder, Mudgett changed his identity to Henry Howard Holmes. A new beginning and a new set of characteristics not known in the United States, H.H. H. Holmes was, at this point, about to make himself as infamous as Jack the Ripper. In 1886, and after the rebuilding of the city due to a massive fire in 1871 that burned a majority of Chicago, Holmes moved to a southern suburb of the city. He was able to find a pharmacy clerk position at E.S. Holton's Pharmacy, located on 63rd Street in Wallace, in the suburb of Inglewood. Several months after his start at the pharmacy, Mr. Everett Holton supposedly passed away of natural causes. H. H. Holmes took advantage of the death and purchased the pharmacy from Mrs. Claire Holton, who reportedly disappeared after the purchase. After the purchase of the pharmacy, Holmes was able to make a nice living, not only with the pharmacy, but with his continued scams. One such scam was the selling of a mineral water elixir which promised to ensure beautiful, soft, white, and smooth skin. The elixir was merely bottled water in a fancy bottle from the city's water supply. In 1888, Holmes was able to secure a lease on the vacant property across from the pharmacy. At this property, Holmes would build his infamous murder castle, which was completed in 1892. While Holmes was making way for the construction of his infamous castle, Word came from London, England, of a butcher murdering and mutilating prostitutes with the nickname of Jack the Ripper. American newspapers reported on the murders and were relieved that something as heinous as the murders in London couldn't happen in the United States. How wrong they would be. Work continued at the Inglewood Project, dubbed the castle, by many of the Inglewood residents. Many laborers of all sorts, carpenters, bricklayers, masonry, you name it. If it had to do with building construction, there was a laborer for it. Unfortunately, not one person was knowledgeable as to how the interior was being built, as Holmes was the architect and the sole handler of the blueprints. Looking at the outside of the building, you would think all was well on the inside. The bottom floor of the building consisted of a pharmacy, a jewelry store, a barber shop, a blacksmith shop, and a restaurant. The third floor was normal, containing rented rooms, offices, and Holmes private suite. The second floor, though, was a different story. It contained 35 rooms, 51 doors and six hallways, specifically designed to disorient anyone walking within from stairways and doorways that led to nowhere, to airtight and soundproofed rooms. Most of the rooms were rigged with gas pipes connected to a control panel in Holmes' closet and equipped with peepholes. The castle's second floor was also equipped with trapdoors, secret passageways, and greased shafts leading directly to the cellar. If one was unfortunate to take a slide into the basement, they may have been met with death and or dismemberment, possible stretching of the body, and ultimately placed in an incinerator. The basement was what one would call a torture chamber. Oh, did I forget? Holmes was also selling skeletons of those who were unfortunate enough to end up in the basement. He would sell the skeletons to local medical schools and universities. There's so much more, but that would mean another video. And at this point, I, I just get chills thinking about the house or a castle of horrors. In the fall of 1889, Benjamin Friedland Peitzel arrived in Chicago with his family. Peitzel was known to have been arrested on several occasions for dabbling in crimes ranging from petty larceny to forgery. Peitzel was married to Carrie Peitzel and had five children, Desi, Alice, Nellie, Howard, and the baby who was named Wharton. Peitzel was a devoted father and husband, working any job he can find. It is said Peitzel became a bit depressed and started to drink way too much. Eventually though, Peitzel saw and answered an ad in the paper for the position of a carpenter for a new building in Englewood.
Weitzel would eventually meet H. H. Holmes, a meeting that would change he and his family's life in a very twisted way. Holmes and Peitzel became remarkably close, close enough to be considered a member of Peitzel's family. Peitzel would continue to work for Holmes much longer than anyone in the past. He would also come to learn of Holmes' scams and cons. May 1st, 1893, the World's Columbian Exposition, known also as the Chicago World's Fair of 1893, was open to the public in the city of Chicago. Over 20 million people from around the world attended the exposition through October 30th of 1893. Holmes used the World's Fair as an opportunity to make tons of money. The castle stood only three miles west of the 1893 Columbian Exposition Fairgrounds, which was perfect for fairgoers who needed lodging near the fair. Holmes would visit the World's Fair in hopes of meeting wealthy elderly women and making sure he invited them back to the castle for a night's stay in his luxury hotel. Some of the guests would walk out and others would not. Holmes not only was a scammer and con, but he was also a ladies man. As an attractive young doctor with deep blue eyes and a supposed businessman, Holmes was able to win the hearts of many women throughout his life. Holmes was also able to marry three women it's not that bad to marry three women, but when you are married to them at the same time and have several mistresses, okay, that's a little bit of a problem. Several of the mistresses went missing. One mistress in 1890, Julia Connor, became Holmes' employee and mistress. Julia lived at the castle with her daughter, Pearl. When Julia became pregnant, she demanded she and Holmes get married. Holmes agreed. However, there was one condition that she allow him to perform an abortion on her. After the abortion, Julia and Pearl were never seen again. A week later, Holmes sold a skeleton to the Hahnemann Medical College for about $200. It is thought that the skeleton was that of Julia Connor. In 1893, Minnie Williams became Holmes' private secretary and mistress. Minnie, who was a beneficiary of a property in Fort Worth, Texas, which was valued at $40,000, for whatever reason, signed over the property to Holmes. Just after signing over the property, Holmes murdered Minnie and her sister Nanny. In 1894, Holmes married Georgiana Yoke, becoming his third wife. However, he married her under the name of Henry Mansfield Howard. Georgiana would be lucky to live out her full life, as would all of his wives. As Peitzel became more of a liability due to his drinking and knowledge of Holmes' crimes, Holmes took to his old ways. In November of 1893, Holmes planned with Benjamin Peitzel and his wife Carrie to fake Benjamin's death for a nice insurance payout. Before carrying out their plan, Holmes and Peitzel traveled around the states, swindling whoever they could. In July of 1894, Holmes attempted to swindle another pharmacy owner in St. Louis. However, this time, it didn't work out as he planned. Holmes was arrested. While in jail, Holmes befriended a notorious outlaw, Marion Hedgepath. Hedgepath was known as the handsome bandit who robbed trains, was a hired gun for some, and a killer in the American West. The two shared a jail cell. For whatever reason, Holmes told Hedgepath about his insurance con he had been planning. Hedgepath assisted Holmes in locating an attorney for Peitzel and Holmes to collect on their fraudulent insurance plan. In return, Holmes told Hedgepath he would send him $500 after the insurance was paid out. Holmes was eventually bailed out of jail by his wife, Georgiana. Peitzel and Holmes eventually traveled to Philadelphia, arriving at 1316 Callow Hill Street. This address will be where Peitzel, masquerading as B.F. Perry, would be found dead. 
The murder was covered up by an explosion and chloroform. Peitzel's face was also burned and disfigured. For insurance purposes, Holmes and 15-year-old Alice Peitzel were requested to identify the body. After the identification, the coroner's office ruled the death accidental. Peitzel's wife, Carrie, was under the impression her husband was still alive and the plan worked perfectly. The insurance company paid out the money to Carrie, which Holmes was able to convince her to give most of it to him. In the meantime, Holmes also convinced Carrie to allow him to take her three children to another location where they would be accompanied by her husband, Benjamin Peitzel. Now remember, Benjamin Peitzel is no longer alive. Ultimately, the children would also be found dead in 1895 through the detective work of Frank Geyer. He discovered the charred remains of Howard Peitzel in a stove at a home in Indianapolis. And the two little girls, Nellie and Alice Peitzel, were found in a Toronto, Canada home, buried in the cellar. Prior to burying the two little girls in the cellar, Holmes put them both in a trunk with the hole at the top and put in a pipe that contained poisonous gas. The two little girls died before they were buried in the cellar. Remember Hedgepath? He was never paid $500 and reported Holmes to the police, telling them of Holmes' plan to kill Peitzel for an insurance scam. In 1894, the Pinkerton Detective Agency was hired to locate Holmes. Holmes was found and arrested in Boston by the Pinkertons on November 17, 1894. After his arrest, Holmes was transported to a prison in Philadelphia. Holmes would be tried for conspiracy to cheat and defraud the Fidelity Mutual Life Insurance Company. Ah, poor Holmes, stuck in jail with other criminals just like him. In 1895, while Holmes was in jail, Chicago police entered the castle and discovered what could only be described as a torture chamber within the basement. After searching the castle, police found there were at least 50 people, 5050, who were missing after staying at the hotel. As you can imagine, word spread nationally and internationally of the murder castle and at least six persons who were allegedly murdered by Holmes. On September 23, 1895, Holmes' trial date was set for the murder of Benjamin Peisel. The trial, awaited by many, began on October 28, 1895, at the Philadelphia City Hall. On the first day of his trial, Holmes dismissed his attorneys and decided to represent himself. What's that saying? The man who defends himself in court as a fool for a lawyer and a jackass for a client? Yeah, that's it. Holmes rehired his attorneys as he knew he had made a dreadful mistake. On the third day of the trial, Carrie Peitzel took the witness stand and recounted the insurance scam and the loss of her husband and three children. The testimony of Carrie Peitzel brought the courtroom to tears, except for one, H. H. Holmes. After all was said and done, Holmes was found guilty of murder in the first degree. He was sentenced to death by hanging on May 7th of 1896. While in jail and awaiting his sentence of death, Holmes was made an offer by William Randolph Hearst to provide his confession. In the confession, Holmes said he had killed 27 people, though it would later be found some of the people he said he murdered were alive and well. The confession was chilling. You can read the confession by clicking on the link provided below. A few of Holmes' last words were, I was born with the devil in me. When it came time for Holmes to be hanged, he recanted his confession and said it was all a fabrication. Immediately after he recanted, he was hanged and pronounced dead 10.25 a.m. As noted by historians, it took 15 minutes before Holmes died. At his request, when Holmes was buried, he was encased in cement. What are your thoughts? How many people do you think Holmes murdered? Six, nine, 10, 50, hundreds? 
or did he not murder anyone at all? What do you think about the castle Holmes built for what seemed to be his enjoyment of torture? Just a special note, while researching, I found some information conflicting and controversial. I did my very best to compromise when creating this video. Thank you for watching this episode of True Crimes with Ricochet Reigns. As always, hold tight to the ones you love and take care of yourself.